In this session, I'll be talking about how nonviolent communication can support us in deepening our intimate relationships. And let's start with a dialogue that is likely to be heard in almost any intimate relationship, at least variations of it. One person says to the other, Do you love me? And the other person said, Oh, yes, of course. And the first person said, But I want you to be really sincere about this. So, you know, please, I want you to seriously look at this. Do you love me? And the other person seriously contemplates this and waits and thinks and then finally said, Yes, I really do. And the first person said, Then why did it take you so long to respond? This question is very important, you know, do you love me? And it's very hard to answer because we very often don't get clear in intimate relationships what we really mean by that word love. In an earlier session, I mentioned how some people use the word love as a feeling, an emotion. And if they do that, it's pretty hard to know how to answer that question without reference to a specific time and place, because feelings change every few seconds. In nonviolent communication, we use the word love as a need, and a very important need. And what's very important, then, is to know how to manifest this need, what to do to contribute to that need being met in the people that we care for and that we have intimate relationships with. I have found in working with couples for many years that the best way that we can really meet people's need for love is to do two things. To, first of all, express those needs within us, those messages within us, that are the hardest to express, the most scary to express. Because when we have that ability to share that which is not easy to express, we get a chance to get these needs fulfilled. But if we are so frightened of expressing these needs that we don't say anything, that creates barriers in the relationship. Yet it's very difficult for many reasons for people to express these needs that need to be expressed in intimate relationships. And when they do express the need, very often it's done with an energy that provokes the very opposite of what we would really like. And the reason for that is that instead of seeing expressing needs as a gift to other people, in the culture that we've lived within for about 10,000 years, needs get associated with something very negative. They get associated with being needy. They get associated with being selfish, egocentric. So as a result, when we do express the need, we often do it with that energy behind it. And that leads the need to be heard by other people often as something that is very negative. For example, if I have a need for some support for helping with my children on a given day, I have an important appointment, I can't find uh, some way to take care of the children and get to this appointment, and I need some support, someone to help me with the children... So I go to my partner and I say, I know you've got a lot of things planned today. And I had talked about this day being your time to do these things. But you see, I just got an appointment with the doctor that I need to do. And I know it's not necessary for me to do it. I know I could postpone it for another day. In other words, the more I go on with this kind of apology for having the need and justifying it, the harder it is for the other person to give out of a loving energy. So what's very important is to develop a consciousness that our needs are a precious gift if they are expressed in a way in which we are not 
demanding that the person meet our request in relationship to our needs. If the other person trusts that when we say our needs and we follow it with a request, that we only want them to do it, if they can do it willingly, joyfully. So when we have this consciousness that our needs are a gift, we then express them with a totally different energy, an energy that makes it much easier for the other person to enjoy receiving our needs and makes it much easier for them to respond out of the joy of giving. So the intent behind expressing our needs in an intimate relationship is very important, that we see the need as a gift. And then there's two other things that are very important in expressing needs, and that is that we follow the need that isn't being met that we would like to have fulfilled with a clear request. If we simply express the need without the request, it often leaves the other person in a position either of not being too clear what we want or with the idea that we expect them to know what we want them to do about it. So, for example, if partner one says to partner two, I'm very lonely right now and I really need some connection, and then stops and doesn't say anything about what they're wanting at that moment from the other person. It's very easy for the other person to hear that, well, this person has an expectation of me. I'm supposed to know what it is they want right now. So once we have expressed a need that isn't being met, we need to follow it with a very clear request. And then, as I said in prior sessions, we want to be sure that the other person hears a request and not a demand. And that's often not easy, because especially in an intimate relationship, given what some people have been taught about intimacy and love, if they hear a need of somebody they care for, they can turn it into something they have to do something about. They believe that they are responsible for this other person's happiness, and therefore they must do what this person wants. When we receive the other person's needs in this way, if we do what they want, they'll pay for it. They'll pay for it because we are not giving out of a joyful energy. We're giving out of expectation energy, should energy, or we're giving out of energy to buy the other person's love. And when I say that we pay for it whenever somebody does something for us out of this kind of energy... I'm thinking of uh, an example of one night. Two in the morning, my doorbell was ringing. I get out of bed, open the door, and it's a woman, eight months pregnant. She's crying her heart out. It's pouring rain out. And I said, come in, come in. I sit her down in my living room. And she cries and said, I've been married eight years. I've been married eight years. My husband has always been so loving, so loving. He's always done everything I've ever asked. And tonight, tonight I asked for a little thing. And he said, get out. And he pushed me out the door. Well, this is a rough way to be woken up in the middle of the night. And I said, uh, excuse me, are you one of my neighbors? She said, no, I come from the other part of town. I said, well, how, how did you get over here? She said, I didn't know what to do. I was desperate. So I called my mother. She lives in another state. And I said, what should I do, mother? And my mother was in a workshop with you last month. And she told me that I should come over and talk to you about this. I said, oh, I see. So she told me further about this husband and how no matter what she ever asked for, ever wanted, the husband did. I had a guess right away what was going on. This husband was one of these very nice, loving people who believes that he's responsible for the happiness of the other person, and that in order to be loved himself, he must deny his needs and always take care of the other person. 
And this always seems very wonderful for the other person until one day, one day like this woman, you pay for it. Because when we give out of this belief that if I am a husband or a wife, it's my responsibility to make the other person happy. I'm responsible for their well-being. This confusion about what responsibility means, this thinking that it means I'm responsible for the other person's happiness, puts us into a very awkward bind because we can only be responsible for that over which we have some control. We can only control what goes on within ourselves. We can't control what goes on in others. So when I trick myself into thinking I'm responsible for my partner's happiness, I'm taking on a job that I can't do. I cannot make the other person happy. I can only be responsible for my own actions, my own intentions. The other person is responsible for how they take what I do, how they interpret it, and what they do to get their needs met. So keeping this concept of responsibility clear is very important in intimate relationships. It's very important to see that we cannot be responsible for other people's happiness. We cannot be responsible for other people's actions. We're responsible for our own intentions and actions. So when we take responsibility for other people's feelings, whenever they are in distress, we feel pressure. We have to do something about it. It's our job to make the person feel better. This will take all joy out of anything we do to contribute to the other person's well-being. So let's go back to that story about the woman crying in my living room because her husband had always given to her everything she wanted, always took care of her, and then one night she asked for a little thing and he says, get out. We called him up and asked him to come over. And he came over and it was very clear from the beginning that he was one of these people who thought that if you love somebody, you have to deny your own needs. You have to suppress them and take care of the other person in order to buy love so that they will keep loving you, in order to avoid guilt so you don't feel guilty if you say no to something and they feel hurt and you feel as though it's your no that hurt them rather than how they took it. There's a poem that we used to say in my neighborhood when we were children. If somebody called you a name, we would recite this poem. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. That was a very important thing to learn, to learn that what other people say or do can't hurt us. It's how we take it. If somebody says no to us, that can't make us feel bad. It's how we interpret the no. But we lose this consciousness. We lose the wisdom of that poem as we get educated in a way that makes interdependence not what happens in intimate relationships, but codependence, where people take on responsibility for each other's happiness and that requires giving up your own honesty, your own integrity. You must always do what the other person wants to make them happy. That soon makes the person that we have the deepest relationship with the biggest burden of all. That's why it's so much easier for many people to respond to a need of a neighbor than it is to respond to the person that they're the closest with. Men and women seem to get different kinds of cultural education that make intimacy difficult for them in different ways. For example, many of the women I work with have a difficult time expressing their needs. They have internalized cultural programming that says that loving women have no needs. So to demonstrate their love for others, they believe that you must suppress your needs in favor of the other person. Men, on the other hand, seem to have a real difficulty expressing their feelings, especially any feelings that imply vulnerability, like feeling hurt or sad or lonely. They are educated in what I call the John Wayne 
concept of masculinity. You're not supposed to have such vulnerable feelings. To remind myself of this, I keep a picture of John Wayne in my office. It shows him with six arrows in him, and he says, It only hurts when I laugh. One of the messages that is very important to know how to say in an intimate relationship is no. Especially when the person that we care for has some need that seems very strong at the moment and they're in some pain. But things within us are going on such that we can't really give with the kind of energy that nonviolent communication recommends that we give out of. That is, that we do it totally willingly. We're not giving in or giving up. So how do we say no under these very difficult conditions? For example, let's say that our partner looks very lonely and says, you know, I'm lonely this evening and I have a real need for some companionship. So would you be willing to put down that work you're doing and just come and spend some time with me? Well, now, how do we say no to that if there's, for whatever reason, something that keeps us from doing it out of joy, out of willingness, out of making sure that we're not giving in or giving up. How do we say no? Well, the first step in saying no is to make empathic connection with the other person's needs. The empathic connection lets the other person know that we do care about their needs. We show that care by taking the time to stop and really connect with what's going on in them. Sometimes this can be just non-verbally communicated. They can see in our eyes that we are really with them. We see their loneliness. We see their needs. Or sometimes we might express it verbally. We might say, so you're really lonely this evening and really need some connection. That's an important step in saying no, to begin by either verbally or non-verbally communicating that we are with them in the need. We see what's going on in them. If we're so tense about the fact that we're not wanting to do what the other person is asking us to do, that the first thing they see in our eyes is some tension or fear, they can easily mistake that we have received their need not as a gift, but as something negative. So we start with this empathy for the other person's needs when we say no, and then we follow it with the need of ours that keeps us from willingly being able to do what they're asking of us at this moment. So in some situation it might be said this way, I have a need right now to take a lot of the pressure off myself of things that people are wanting of me at work. So, I express here a need at this moment that's present in me that keeps me from being able to willingly contribute to what my partner might be requesting. But then it's important to follow the need that keeps me from saying yes with a request that searches for a way to get everybody's needs met. And that might sound like this. I'd like you to tell me if our getting together in about a half an hour would be okay for you. I think in that half hour I could release my tension and be able to be fully with you. So, to say no, we empathically connect with the other person's needs, silently or verbally. We say our need that keeps us from saying yes, and we end on a request that searches for a way to get everybody's needs met. We never say, I can't, I don't have time. We go through the process I mentioned, and then the person is better able to see that their need was received as a gift and that we care about their need, even if at this moment there's 
a need of ours that keeps us from doing what the person wants. Now, if our partner doesn't know how to say no in this way, we need to be prepared to know how to deal with somebody who doesn't know how to say no and who either gives in because they hear a demand or responds in other ways that are hard to live with. So what are some of these hard ways to live with when our partners might hear our needs and requests as demands and not know how to say no in the way that I just outlined? Well, one way a person often says no when they hear a demand is no. And you can tell from the tone of their voice that they heard a demand. They heard pressure upon them. Or, of course, another way that some people handle a request they don't want to respond to, they make a diagnosis of what is wrong with the person for having the need. And so if we are going to be good at expressing our needs, we want to be sure that we are prepared to deal with somebody who gives us a diagnosis for having our needs and who says things to us like, you're too sensitive, you're too dependent, you're too this, you're too that. Whatever it is that they diagnose us at, if we don't empathically connect with what's going on in them when they say that, if we take that, that there is something wrong with us for having our needs, we have just given that person some power that's not good for either of us. We've given them the power to make us feel that our needs are something negative, that they are caustic. So it's very important that we know how to respond empathically to people when they do respond that way to our needs, when they say, no, or when they say these diagnoses of us for having the needs. We need to hear the feelings and needs behind their no or behind the criticism, judgment, diagnosis that they make of us for having the needs. So if the other person says in response to my having said that I'm lonely and would like some company and to ask them to come over and sit with me and talk for a while, if they say back, you're so dependent, can't you take care of yourself? I got to be sure that I don't hear what they think of me. I got to be sure that I go right to their heart and hear what are they feeling? What are they needing when they say that? And so I might respond this way. So are you frustrated right now because you're wanting to do what you've chosen to do and not give that up because you think you need to take care of me? And if the other person says, you're darn right then I might want to do what is necessary to help them learn how to hear my need as a gift and my request as gifts and not as demands. And I might say to the person, can you tell me how I could have expressed my needs and request to you so that it would be a gift to you and not as a demand? Now, I wouldn't be surprised if that really stunned the other person because this is asking them to make a difference it's not easy for people to make, given how we have been trained to think about intimate relationships, which requires us to give up ourself and take care of the other person. So I wouldn't be surprised if I asked this person, how could I have expressed that so you could receive it as a gift? I wouldn't be surprised if I got this answer, huh? So I might have to repeat that. How can I let you know what my needs are and what I'm requesting of you? so that you can trust that I only want you to do it if you can do it joyfully, that it's not giving in or giving up. And this is pretty complicated for someone to understand, so they might still look very perplexed. And I may want to let them know why this is so important to me. I might say, I'd like you to see that right now I have two options that I see that I don't like having only these two options. The two options are, if I have some needs and requests, to express them, but then if you hear it as a demand, you either then get upset and say no, or you give in either way. It's not what I would like. 
Or, if I keep my needs to myself, then that limits the honesty between us and it limits my ability to get my needs met from you at times, when it might be good for both of us. So, how can I express my needs and my requests so that you receive it as a gift, that you're conscious that I only want you to give if it's from the heart, willingly, and never done out of fear that I won't love you if you don't do it, fear that I will take it as a rejection and get hurt and depressed. So this is very important to work out in intimate relationships, how each party can hear each other's needs when they are expressed in a way that they trust that the partner only wants them to give if it can be done willingly. I'd like to do a song now of what happens when we don't express our feelings and needs honestly. And what can happen when our partner does express their feelings and needs openly and honestly, but we don't receive it empathically. When we do that, the person that we love the most can soon become a festival of pain, as described in this song. Yes, I know I can always count on you I can always count on you To come up with something new Along about the time I think You've done all you can do to me You find another way To rip my pride away Yes, I know I can always count on you For some brand new humiliation Some well thought out and novel degradation You're a festival of pain And I keep coming back again Cause I know I can always count on you you trumped all around my mind At least a million times And I haven't got a dream unspoiled Not an ideal left behind You say my eyes are getting glazy Well, Lord, your love has made me crazy Yes, I know I can always count on you For some brand new humiliation some well thought out and novel degradation You're a festival of pain And I keep coming back again Cause I know I can always count on you Another problem that often makes it hard for people to enjoy giving in an intimate relationship is when their partner skips the need and just expresses their pain and goes immediately to a strategy. For example, if a person says to their partner, I'm feeling very hurt. You've only, you know, been home two days out of the last month in the evening. Would you please Correct your schedule so that you are home at least four evenings a week. Now, notice what that person has expressed. They've expressed an observation at the amount of time the other person has been home in the evening, and their pain was expressed, but they skipped over the need and went to a strategy. Now, one could assume that wouldn't the other person assume that and guess that the need behind that was uh, for some closeness, for some intimacy that wasn't being met? Well, it's not too likely in my experience that the person on receiving that message is going to be able to do that very easily when the need is not expressed. When they hear the pain and immediately the pain is followed by a request. Very often, in my experience, that request is going to be heard as a demand. So it's very important 
when we are in a good deal of pain about something, that we be conscious that it's by really focusing on our need, making the need clear and our feelings clear. It's that information that when people have that focus, then specific strategies that are requested have a whole different taste to them than if the person goes from the pain to the request. I have suggested an activity to many couples that have consulted with me and who are interested in how can we deepen our relationship. I've said, let me suggest a scary exercise for you. Let me suggest that in your lives that you give space, regular space, to dealing with a scary question. And that scary question is, what am I afraid to tell you? And that when you take the time to do this, the person who responds by saying what is a scary message to say really works hard at expressing that in a way that makes it clear to the other person that there's no criticism or no demand intended in what they say. And it's very important that the other person really be conscious of when people are in the most pain and have the most scary messages to say. Those are the ones we need to be sure we just hear what they're feeling, needing, and requesting and never hear any criticism or demand. Now, not too surprisingly, one of the things that people in relationships find most difficult to talk about is their sexuality and to make it clear whether their needs relative to sex are being met. So one of the things that we recommend is that they get so good at expressing these scary messages that they don't wait to express them when they are sitting down and have time to express them but that they learn to express these scary messages even while they're having sex. In fact, we suggest that to really enjoy sex, you have to know how in the middle of sex to communicate clearly scary messages. And in our weekends that we do for couples, we often do a little exercise on what this would look like how you would express in the middle of the sexual act when your needs are not getting met, how you could do this in a way that would be a gift to the other person. And, oh, people find this very scary to even think of. It seems, oh, my goodness, how unromantic in the middle of the sexual act to express clearly uh, what is not meeting one's needs and what would better meet them. And they think, boy, wouldn't that take away all the romance and joy out of sexuality to have such a conversation in the middle of the act? Well, it may have that association of not being very romantic. And it may go against the cultural programming that if you're really a competent man and woman, you don't have any problems in your sexual relationships. They just flow. But the reality is that to the degree to which you can be honest about such sensitive issues, even in the middle of the sexual act, I predict it's one of the best ways to finally enjoy sexuality more and more. Now that could sound like this. One partner is in a mood for sexuality and communicates non-verbally that they might be open to this by reaching over and touching their partner in a sensitive part of the body in a gentle way, trying to communicate, I'm getting turned on and would really like to get into sex with you. Now, the other party might be really wanting to finish reading what they were reading and they were really involved in it. Now, how do you, when you sense your partner right now is really in a mood for sexuality, how do you respond to that? Well, some people would deny their needs and feel like, oh my goodness, I have to please my partner now. So they might put down what they were reading and put on a pseudo smile and 
say, hey, hey, what's going on? But now, if they do that and continue with the sexual act when they're not really into it, the other person is highly likely to be sensing that they're not into it, and it's probably not going to be a very enjoyable experience for both people. Or if it is for one, to the one who gave in, it's going to have some association with sexuality that both people will pay for, because if we give up our needs for our partner in any aspect of relationships, everybody pays for it eventually. So if the people are courageous and skilled at honesty as nonviolent communication supports, the person who was reading would again start with empathic response to the other person, either nonverbally, just showing by our look that we see the other person is reaching out to us sexually, or might just say words that show that. Looks like you'd like some real closeness and love, honey. And the other person said, yeah. And now comes how to say no honestly, as we've talked about. A person might say, I'm torn right now. I really would like to get into it with you, and yet at the moment I'm not really there. I'm kind of caught in this article I'm reading. How would it be for you if we get into this in about a 20 minutes? So that would be how to express oneself, even in the middle of intimacy, when our needs may not coincide at that moment, when the needs are not the problem there, of course, it's the strategy. Because in that case, the problem was that one person would like to get into the sexual act, but not at this moment. Their strategy was for in a different time. Well, of course, if we are going to be honest like that, we've got to be prepared for the other person not receiving the message empathically. They might just be hearing that as a rejection, and their response might sound something like this. Forget it. I'm sorry I reached out. I should have known that that reading material was more important to you than our relationship. So we've got to be prepared any time we express ourselves vulnerably. We've got to be prepared to empathically deal with what comes back. So in that case, then, the person might say, so sounds like you're feeling really hurt. You were really in the mood right now for some real closeness and intimacy and are disappointed. So we do not take the other person's statement as now we have to give in and take care of them. That wouldn't be good for either. Now in that situation where we respond with words when we see the other person wanting to get into physical activity. Someone might say, isn't that going to destroy the beauty of our intimacy with others when we need to talk in the middle of something? So if somebody reaches out and touches you in this gentle way, uh, wouldn't it be more loving to put down whatever you were working on and get into their energy in whatever way you could. Well, that's one way that people define intimacy, that if you really care for people in an intimate relationship and you see what their needs are, you suppress your own needs and give to them. But my experience is that if we give any time out of an energy where we feel even slightly we have given in or given up our own self, both people pay for it because that adds up and each time we give in out of that, it does something to destroy the relationship. So if the person was honest in the way that I said and the other person gets hurt by it and the person who chose not to get into the sex act at that moment, empathizes with the other person, if that dialogue continues so that in these very sensitive areas we're able to talk about it at the time and be honest and be empathic to the other person's response, that intimacy is very powerful. 
In fact, I believe that it is so powerful that when we have that quality of intimacy that we can be honest even at the most sensitive times. The other aspect of the intimacy, in this case the sexual act, it will get better in the future as a result of people being able to trust that the partner is fully there and there's no giving in or giving up. Now, of course, another thing that can get in the way of intimacy in heterosexual relationships are the stereotypes that we carry about what a man's job is and what a woman's job is. Many people carry the idea that there are certain jobs that the man should do, certain jobs that the woman should do, and that already creates some limits to the quality of connection the two can have because then people are doing things out of should energy, out of have to energy, obligation energy. Nonviolent communication suggests that we really make sure that everything we're doing is done willingly and it's done out of an energy that comes when we see that we are enriching life and it's meeting our need to enrich life so that we never feel as though we are sacrificing ourselves for the other people. When I do empathy training for women, many of the women that I work with find it very hard to hear their partner's needs without losing their own needs. It's as though other people's needs are more important to them. I often recommend to such women an article written by the columnist Ellen Goodman when she warned women, be careful about learning how to empathize better with other people's needs. We've got to be sure as women, she says, that we don't empathize at the cost of losing connection with ourselves. She warns that given our cultural training as women, it's very easy to lose ourselves in other people's needs. So in the work that I do with women, very often I see what Ellen Goodman was talking about, that when women really do empathize and see a partner of theirs needing something, they automatically lose connection with themselves and start to do for the other person. But then they know later that that wasn't in harmony with their needs. They can tell from their feelings there's a different energy when we are giving fully out of our own need to contribute to the other person's well-being. And that isn't mixed at all with this idea that it's our obligation or duty to care for the other person. And many of the men that I work with have a cultural stereotype that as a man, they are totally responsible for their woman's smile and happiness, so that if she's not smiling and happy, it means they have failed somehow as a man. And very often, this makes it hard for them to say no, because they're afraid that if they say no, their partner's going to be unhappy, and the very sign of the woman being unhappy, they interpret that I'm not a very competent man. Especially if the woman is not satisfied totally sexually, then many men take it as a sign of their own inadequacy rather than just empathically connecting with the woman to find out how the woman's needs could be better met. But when we take responsibility for other people's feelings rather than our own actions, that is when our giving is mixed and it doesn't contain the pure joy of giving that's necessary for relationships to be strengthened. As I mentioned earlier, we need to be sure that when we have needs that we express those needs before going to strategies. And when I talked about this earlier, I said if we go immediately to strategy without the need, it's easy for other people to hear this as a demand, as though we are only concerned with what we want. It's when the need is expressed, then it can make it easier to give. 
And then this is also very important in resolving conflicts, that we're aware that when the needs are expressed and fully understood, conflicts can be resolved much easier than when the need isn't evident. This was reflected very powerfully in a training I once did for men and women, and one of the couples that attended said they were on the point of divorce. And I said to them, if you want to work on this, I'd be glad to do it. And the husband said, no, we've tried communicating about this. There's no chance of our resolving it. We've been talking about it for two years, and we just have a conflict in our needs. But the wife wanted very much to at least talk about it with me, so the husband agreed. And I said, if you each tell me what your needs are, I'll bet you that we might see some resolution that hasn't occurred to you. And the husband said, well, we've been over the needs many times, many times, and we don't get anywhere. I said, well, let's try again. And he said, well, here's the problem. My need is I need a divorce. And she says she needs to keep the relationship together. I could see right away what the problem was, that they had gone immediately to strategies, and neither of them really knew what needs of the other person weren't being met. So I pointed this out, that what I call a need doesn't involve a strategy. It's separate from the strategy, and that getting a divorce or staying together is a strategy. So I said, what needs are not being met by both of you in the relationship? If we can get the focus on that, I'll bet you then we will either find a strategy that might involve divorce, but it'll meet everybody's needs, or it might involve staying together, but again, it will meet everybody's needs. Well, it took us about an hour just to help them get clear what their needs were because they kept wanting to tell me what they thought was the problem in terms of the other person. He said, well, the problem with her is that she's two, and she was coming back with a similar diagnosis of her husband, and they hadn't been trained in nonviolent communication, so they weren't conscious that whenever we tell people what we think about them, that's not a very effective way of getting our needs met. With my help, they finally got their needs clear. And at that point, they came to a resolution. In this case, they chose to stay together. Now, I have worked with other couples that when they really got their needs clear, they did see that a divorce might be the best strategy for both of them. But of course, when you get to a resolution that way, it is a far different resolution and is going to be far more fulfilling to both people than if we go directly to strategies and don't really make sure that the strategy is a way of getting everybody's needs met. In fact, one couple that I worked with, after my helping them both get clear what their needs were and hearing each other's needs, they did both see that a divorce might be the best way for both of them. But this was done with such a loving energy to come to that that they decided to have a divorce ceremony and invited relatives from both sides to attend the ceremony. Now a divorce arrived at in that way is going to be quite different for the children than a divorce that's arrived at through the usual adversarial procedures. In one city in the United States, in the family court, we have trained social workers to be able to use nonviolent communication in helping couples going through a divorce to come to some resolution in the divorce settlement that met everybody's needs. In this situation, Couples going through a divorce then have an option. They can go through the usual adversarial procedures or they can request to go through a three, two-hour mediation session with social workers who are trained in using nonviolent communication. 
I had lunch one day with the judges in this family court program, and they were very pleased, they told me, with what it did for couples who chose to go through the mediation session so that everybody's needs were clarified in the process and an attempt found to meet everybody's needs. They could see how different it would be for the children to then be with either parent that they were going to be with, where the resolution was one that didn't end on animosity and competition, but on a loving way, finding the best way possible to go in separate ways, but in a way that meets everybody's needs. As I've mentioned, uh, the John Wayne consciousness that I developed growing up as a male uh, has made it a real challenge to express my vulnerable feelings when I've been hurt or scared. It's as though men don't have those kind of feelings. I can recall that one time I was in school as a child, and I was hiding inside the school because there were some several people waiting to beat me because they didn't like my last name. They didn't like Jews. And I was scared to death as a nine-year-old boy, and I would hide from them very often to avoid getting beaten up. So one day when a teacher saw me hiding in the classroom, it was an hour after school was over, and she was surprised to see a child still in school, especially hiding in the school. And she says, what are you doing here? And I said, I pointed out the window, those boys are waiting out there to beat me up. She said, but school is over. You have to leave the school now. I said, but I'm scared. And she said, boys don't get scared. Well, I got a lot of evidence from my cultural education that boys don't get scared, boys don't get hurt, they don't get sad. If you're a real man, you don't have any of these feelings. And unfortunately for me, I took her words in and believed it and found it hard to admit when I was scared, hard to admit these other feelings as well. About 25 years later... I was doing some work in Toronto, Canada with about 80 women. These women were sole support parents. They had no partners and they were poor. And I was doing a workshop with them. And in the process, one of them said something about her gratitude that I would come up there and offer this training and especially do it knowing that they had very little money to give me. And I was so touched by the gratitude that I received that in front of these 80 women, I started to cry. I couldn't look up. I felt such shame. How could I reveal such vulnerability in front of these women? And when I finally got my courage up to look up, Instead of seeing the contempt that I expected to see in their eyes, it was just the opposite. I had never seen such respect or caring in my life. Now, this was a shock that I could reveal such feelings and get such a response. And I started to cry all the more. And now I really felt ashamed and it was hard to look up and I was telling myself, my goodness, these poor women are giving me five dollars a piece for this day, and I'm crying away their time. And when I did look up, I didn't see one woman that looked as though she was angry that I was crying away their time. All I saw was caring, compassion. Well, I've met a lot of men who share the same cultural upbringing that I went through. They find it so hard to reveal these vulnerable feelings. And it's catastrophic what effect this has on intimate relationships because it's our ability to courageously share the depth of our vulnerability that adds to the depth of intimate relationships. I was doing a workshop in the United States, and in the group 
was a man and woman who had been married for about 35 years, and they were about to get a divorce. But one of their children strongly recommended that before they get the divorce, they come to the training. And in the training, the man sat there and seldom said a word. He just seemed to have all of whatever was alive in him locked inside. And I did a role play with another woman who told me about a husband that wasn't expressing his feelings. And she said, Marshall, can you kind of play my husband's role and guess what you think might be going on in him? that makes it hard for him to express his feelings. So in playing the husband's role, I said, Wife, it's hard for me to express my feelings because all this cultural training telling me I shouldn't have these vulnerable feelings, it's like I put them in a part of myself and lock that up. And locking that up, I feel safe. But I feel very vulnerable if I let any of it out. Is that clear to you? And This man who saw me playing that role, he said, That's me. And his wife looked at him and said, What? He said, That's me. Just what Marshall said is what it's like for me. I have all those feelings in there, but it's like they're locked inside and I can't get at them. And his wife was so happy just to hear that much coming from him as something she had wanted in their whole marriage. Just that he could recognize those feelings and say that they were in there was such a relief to her. And, of course, we then went further to help him to see what it would be like to actually express them and to see that when we express those feelings, those needs, which are the most scary for us to express. The not doing it is very costly in the relationship, and when we do it vulnerably, without criticism, without demand, and the other person empathically receives it, the relationship is going to be powerfully nurtured. This concludes Session 5 of the Nonviolent Communication Training Course with Marshall Rosenberg. Our program continues with Session 6. 